Amen. So we're going to finish up John chapter 2 tonight. So far, um, this, is our, this will be our fifth sermon in John chapter 2. And um, we looked at the uh, water to wine miracle, how Jesus didn't serve alcohol. We looked at what Jesus did in the temple. We looked at, um, I did a sermon on, you know, buying and, you know, selling in church. We looked at um, righteous and unrighteous anger. Jesus obviously got angry um, when he saw um, these money changers in the temple, of course, but you know, Jesus had a righteous anger, meaning that there is a righteous anger since Jesus is without sin. We looked at the temple um, of your body, and tonight we're going to look at these last two, maybe three verses of um, John chapter 2, um, which gives us, I'm going to show you tonight how these three verses give us a very unique perspective um, that is much different than the other perspectives that we usually take on, um, you know, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So, in order to kind of get prime the pump on this, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 29. Go to Genesis chapter 29, and let me get, kind of give you a, a, a primer on what I'm going to talk about this evening. I'm going to tell you kind of a sad story um, this evening, all right? I'm going to tell you kind of a sad story in the Bible from a different perspective than maybe you've heard it um, before. But turn to Genesis chapter 29. So Genesis chapter 29 is a story about Jacob going and meeting Laban. So, of course, in Genesis chapter 28, Isaac, Jacob's father, tells him that he doesn't want him to take a bride of the children of Canaan, you know, they're of, the, of these heathen people. So he wants him to go to his own people and find Laban's children, their relatives of theirs, and, and marry one of the daughters of his own people. And so that's what Jacob is doing in Genesis chapter 29. He's going to find a proper, he's taking his parents' advice, he's taking his dad's advice on who he should marry and who he shouldn't marry, and, you know, he's doing a good job, so he goes, and he runs into, um, he runs into Rachel, um, she's tending a flock of sheep, and of course he, he, he loves her right away, and, you know, it's, it's kind of love at first sight, um, but look down to Genesis chapter 29, and look at verse number 17, so I'm going to tell you this story for just a few minutes, if you would just um, bear with me for a few minutes, but I want to tell you this story from a different perspective tonight. Look at verse number 17. So Rachel, um, the, the, this verse is, is kind of describing Rachel to us. Okay, so Rachel had an older sister named Leah. So Leah and Rachel, of course, they both become Jacob's wives. I don't want to give it away. But look at the Bible says in Genesis chapter 29, verse 17. The Bible says Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. So Leah is the older of the daughters. We find that out a little bit later. But the Bible here is telling us, you know, you say, what does it mean to be uh, tender-eyed or, you know, whatever. A lot of people have, have taken that specifically to mean, you know, maybe she, it, what it basically means is if you just look at the second part of the verse, it means she wasn't as attractive physically um, as her, her younger sister was. And, you know, you know, Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Leah was tender-eyed. Maybe, you know, she just didn't have those, those features that she was not as attractive or um, attractive at all. All right? So that's kind of a, a sad way to have her described in the Bible. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. He's talking to Laban, um, the father of both of these girls. In verse number 20, um, skipping down for sake of time, the Bible says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. So Jacob tells Laban that he loves his, his, um, his daughter Rachel, you know, his second oldest daughter Rachel, and that he, he will work for him for seven years in order to marry um, this girl Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. So Jacob really loves Rachel, and he really wants to marry her. And it sounds like a, a story, just kind of, uh, uh, kind of a match made in heaven here. Look at verse number 21. Then Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife. So now he's done serving the seven years. For my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for an handmaid. So... He basically gives Leah this, um, this servant to be her servant, Zilpah, who comes into play later. But, and it says, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. So we don't know exactly how um, you know, Jacob was tricked by Laban, Laban here. Um, I'm, I'm assuming alcohol was involved, um, probably. Um, but that's just my um, opinion. So he, Laban tricks 
Laban tricks Jacob, and instead of you know, sending his daughter Rachel to marry him, he finds some way to trick Jacob, maybe by giving him too much to drink or whatever. That's just my um, extrapolation. The Bible doesn't say that. But somehow he tricks him into marrying the wrong girl, into marrying Leah instead. And Jacob is upset. He said, did I not serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. So Laban basically says, I, I want my, younger, my older daughter to be married first. He's like, that's the way that it should be. Now look at verse 27. Laban says, fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So this is kind of a, a nice little verse to show you, like we've talked about Daniel's 70 weeks, Daniel's 70th weeks, to kind of show that that's actually talking about seven years um, in verse 27. But that being said, Laban basically tells uh, Jacob, he's like, yeah, you married my daughter Leah. He's like, but just serve, work for me seven more years, and then I'll give you, you know, Rachel, the one that you wanted to marry, in the first place. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. He worked for another seven years. Imagine that. And he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. And Laban gave Rachel, his daughter, Bilhah, his handmaid, to be her maid. So he gives Rachel a servant just as he gave um, Leah a servant. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. Think about this for a minute, though. Now, I want you to look at this story from Leah's perspective, and that's where it kind of gets to be a sad story. At this point, Leah has been married to Jacob by herself. It has been, you know, she has been, you know, his only wife. He has been, you know, her only husband. And now he marries this second wife, Rachel, which not only does he marry a second wife, which the Bible teaches against, but it was the wife he really wanted in the first place. You know, from Leah's perspective, look at this in verse 31. It said, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. So God sees and he feels for Leah, so he gives her children. And Leah conceived in verse 32, and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she had said, for she had she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Look at that. So she is afflicted. She is you know, tormented. She is in a, she is not in a good place. The Lord has looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, and this is really sad, this statement right here. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. So she's just thinking, this is a woman, uh, Leah, who is sitting here and she's thinking, what can I do to make my husband love me? That's a really sad story. That's a really sad story from Leah's perspective. There's a lot to learn in this story, but I want you to think about it from Leah's perspective this evening. It's really sad. I mean, here is this woman who gets married to this, this man, her father. I mean, you could say it was Laban's fault, but still, Leah's married to this man who doesn't seem to want her. He doesn't seem to, he definitely loves Rachel more than he loves her, which is, by the way, like, you know, why it just never works out, this marrying multiple wives in the Bible. But he got the wife he really wanted, and it's very sad. You know, I'm sure Leah would have been thrilled if Jacob just would have said, you know, I just want to be married to you the rest of my days. That is literally what Leah yearns for in her life again and again and again. And we see this story between Leah and Rachel play out. Think they're sisters. And we see this play out in the Bible, oh, there's just this jealousy. I mean, imagine having this jealousy, this competition for your own husband. You know, and even, you know, against your sister. But the point I'm trying to get you to understand is the story of Leah here in the Bible is, is a story of unreturned love. It's a story of someone who loves someone more than that person loves them back. And it's really sad. I mean, she's not wanted as much as she wants to be wanted from, you know, the most important person in her life, which is her husband. Now turn to John chapter 2. With that in mind, turn to John chapter 2. And let's look at the last three verses of John chapter 2. We get a unique, in these last three verses, we get a unique perspective 
change on the life of Jesus, on the person of Jesus in these last three verses. Look at the verse number 23 of John chapter 2. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, the Bible says, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Many people were getting saved, is what that is saying. Many people were, you know, seeing the miracles and believing he was the Messiah and trusting in him and being saved. Now is where it kind of gets sad right here. Look at verse number 24. It says, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. It's talking about the people that got saved. It says Jesus didn't commit himself unto them. Who is them? The people that believed in his name. It said, you say, why, why not? It says, because he knew all men, and he deemed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What does this mean? What does this mean? What do these three verses mean? Look, turn to John chapter 12. Turn to John chapter 12. What it means is Jesus knew man. Jesus didn't need anyone to come give him a lecture on who man was, how, you know, I'm talking about people. Who people were, what people would do. We're talking about saved people here. The Bible is saying that Jesus didn't need anyone to testify to him about the hearts of men. He knew the hearts of men. And so he didn't commit himself. He knew. What does it mean? It says he knew they couldn't be trusted. Look at verse 12 of John chapter 12. Look at verse, this is the story of Jesus' life on earth from his perspective. Think about this. This is Jesus' perspective on man, on people, the very people that he was there to save. Think about that. Look at verse 12 of John chapter 12. Now, this is the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem here. This is uh, Palm Sunday. It says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of of the Lord. All of these people caused this ruckus, and I grew up in, in a Lutheran church, and it was Palm Sunday, and we would all have palms, and we'd be walking around to celebrate this great event of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. People are laying, you know, he's, he's riding on this donkey, and they're laying down all these things. They're treating him like a king. The question is, though, where were all these people a few days later when he was hanging on the cross? Where were all these people that are like, oh, king of Israel, and they're just bowing down to him, and he's on the cross, and it's John and a couple of the women. Where were all these people? They're gone. Even his own disciples fled. Peter denied him. The disciples, they took off. Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. His love, go to John 15. Go to John chapter 15. I just gave you, I gave you the story of Leah just kind of as a primer. It doesn't even really compare, though, because what I'm trying to get you to see here from the Bible is that it was Jesus' love, Jesus' action towards man that was unreturned. Look at verse 18 of John 15. Look at what, I mean, Jesus says, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Jesus knew that the world hated him. He came to save whosoever in the world that hated him. And he couldn't commit himself unto man. He wouldn't commit himself unto man because he knew that about man. So you say, what, what can we learn? What can we learn from this? He's like, it's terrible. It's a, sad, it's a sad perspective to look at it from Jesus' perspective that he's, he's coming to save a world that doesn't appreciate it. He's coming to sacrifice everything for people that don't appreciate it. The saved people that don't appreciate it. What about the people that just reject him? We didn't even mention that. But the world hated him. So what can we take from this? What can we learn from it? The first one is this, and it's a small point, but you know, the, the first one that I want you to take away from this, the first point I'm going to make tonight is that everyone that goes to hell deserves it. Don't ever get into this, don't ever get into this philosophy or this have this 
heart in you. And, you know, we all go out soul winning and we all have the heart. We have, we have hearts for the lost. And you've heard me say it. I've heard you say it. We we've meet some nice guy and he just, ah, I just don't really have time. And, ah, man, we've all said that. We've all said that. But look, everyone that goes to hell deserves it. You deserve it. You're just not going to go because you're saved. Don't get into this philosophy where we think, oh, he's so nice, she's so nice, that you start to doubt the justice of hell. Jesus came here to offer himself for whosoever. If people reject it, there's serious consequences for that. We all deserve hell. Saved people deserve hell. They're just not going to get what they deserve. Everybody else is just going to get what they deserve. So when you look at how not only the world rejected Jesus, but even the saved people, Jesus couldn't commit himself to them. That's a sad situation. What does that mean? Here's the second point. Here's the second point right here. Go back to verse number 24. Let me explain that to you. We're verse 24. So the first one is, don't ever doubt the justice of hell. People that are in hell, people that go to hell, they deserve it. We deserve it. We're just not going to get what we deserve. Look at verse 24 where it says, Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Commit means to rely upon them, to, to put his faith upon them. Let me ask you this. Are you committed to men? Because Jesus couldn't be committed to men. So that's the question that you need to ask yourself. Jesus, he was here for something more important. He couldn't commit what he was doing to any group of people. I don't care if they were saved or not. He couldn't commit himself to men. His ministry was above that. He was here to accomplish a goal, and that goal could not be attached to what any group of men or any man did or didn't do. So that's the question we need to ask ourselves this evening as we see this example from Jesus what man or what person could make you quit your ministry because to Jesus there was nobody what man or what person could get you to quit the Christian life turn to Isaiah chapter 31 <clears throat> I'm gonna call some people out by name tonight I hope you don't mind Turn to Isaiah chapter 31. I listened to a sermon on Sunday night. So I went to um, Verity, and I saw a brother, now Pastor Stuckey. It was great. It was, it was like we had never, it's like there wasn't a four-year gap. It was just like we just picked up right where we left off. And I told my wife, like, he's such a nice person. Like, he's so much nicer than I ever have been. <laughs> you know, he's just such a nice guy, and, and, and he's going to be, he already is a great church leader. He's going to, the, the people in the Philippines are blessed. Um, to have him. But I listened to a sermon Sunday night by Pastor Thompson, and through talking to, um, through talking to um, Brother Stuckey, he was asking how the church here is going. He was asking, I mean, he asked him about some names and things like that uh, of people who are, who are still there, who are not still there, all those different things. We're just catching up. We're catching up. And uh, then the sermon Sunday night was kind of a, it was a, it was a good sermon by Pastor Thompson about um, just things that pastors will deal with and things that pastors will go through and, you know, how, you know, how you, things you shouldn't do and should do um, regarding your pastor. And really, really two, three names came up to me, kind of popped in my head when I was listening um, to this sermon, just talking about the trials that a, that a ministry will go through. You know, this is an ordination day. And these are the kind of sermons that are, that are necessary. And just the trials that a ministry will go through, the trials that a pastor will go through. And, you know, kind of the, the OGs of our church, the original gangsters of our church kind of popped up in, in my head. You know, Miss Natalie was here since the very beginning. Uh, Miss Natalie was here since the very beginning. And also, um, Brother Trevor and Brother George were here since the very beginning. And, I mean, just we went through a lot together you know, over, over the years, you know, and there was a lot of people, there was a lot of tough times. There was a lot of tough times in the church. There was the first year of Hold Fast Baptist Church that was just a real spiritual battle. It was just a battle that whole year. Then we have, you know, um, sitting in front of me in the, in the service was Brother Jeff, and Brother Jeff literally ran to that fight. 
he literally came to that fight. A lot, of, a lot of friends, you know, like they run away from fights or whatever, but, you know, Brother Jeff saw that there was a spiritual battle going on. He literally, he literally ran to the fight. So, you know, I'm calling people out by name here, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is, is that, you know, you got, you got, and look, I love everybody here. I'm not trying to, like, elevate anyone over anyone else. But I'm just saying that, you know, when, when it comes to, when I look at Brother Trevor and I look at Brother George and I look at Miss Natalie and I look at Brother Jeff, like, these people are warriors in my mind. And then there's my own family, and I don't want to throw them out, but they're expected to follow me. <laughs> but, I mean, these people are warriors in my mind. They were not able by anyone to be knocked off their Christian horse. They were not able, there was no, there was no person that could stop them from serving the Lord. Or no person so far that could stop them from serving the Lord in their life. And look, those are some very tough times. And it's discouraging. It's discouraging when, when you see people, especially people that don't necessarily even leave in a bad way, but they just kind of fall out of the Christian life. They just kind of fade away. You know, that's, that's really hard to see that. And look, I could see I could see that it was difficult for those people to see those things happening. You know, I could see, I could see the pain on their face that I had, you know, in, in my heart. I mean, they, they felt the same things in a, in a degree that I did. But, with, so, I mean, look, I, I say names tonight because there, there's some honor to be had there. There's some honor to be had, you know, being that stable Christian that can't be knocked down by some other man or some other person in your life. There, there's some honor there. There's some honor there. But let me say this. With as much honor that there is there, if those names that I listed for you tonight, if one of them would quit, I would not quit. I don't think they will quit. That's not what I'm saying. But if I would quit, you can't quit. That is what Jesus is, is showing us here. Jesus is saying is that you cannot be committed to men. You're like, you're the pastor. Aren't you committed to us? Yes, I'm committed to you, but this ministry doesn't depend on you. Because this ministry is, is serving Jesus Christ, not any one person, saved or not. And you need to look at that about your ministry. Is there somebody in your life that could knock you out of the Christian life? You're too committed if that's the case. Many people knock themselves out of the Christian life for, you know, people in their family. This is why Jesus just said over and over again, there should be no one that stops you, including your own children, it's as extreme as that sounds. Are you in Isaiah chapter 31? Look at verse number one. This is what Jesus was doing when he said, I will not commit unto men. He would not commit himself unto them. Jesus was on a mission, and it didn't matter what men did or didn't do. Look at verse number one. It says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses and trust in chariots, because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not only to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. So Israel, Israel is used uh, actually like figuratively here, and it's also used, like, literally many times in the Bible where people, you know, they will literally go to Pharaoh um, for help. This is Hezekiah. You know, Rab, Rab Shaki was telling Hezekiah, you know, don't go to, don't go to Pharaoh. He's not going to help you. And he's, he's kind of quoting um, this verse here, so, and paraphrasing it. But what the Bible here is saying is that don't trust in men. It's that you can't rely on men. So you can go to Egypt, go to this powerful nation, and they'll have horses, and they'll have men, and they'll have all these things. But if you don't seek the Lord, it's not going to work. It's like, don't rely on mankind. I'm glad Jesus did not rely on men, on people. I'm glad he didn't commit himself to them. Because we cannot trust in men. Men will let you down. Men will let you down in your life. You're going to have good friends in your life that will let you down. And hopefully, if we all follow, you know, biblical philosophies on relationships and friends, as our friends let us down, we can repair those relationships, we can get those things right, we can Matthew 18 that thing, and just keep growing in our friendships and our brother, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I, I might let you down sometime. You know, I'm just a man. 
I'm not perfect. I may, I may not, you know, call you as much as you want to be called, or I may not, uh, you know, do something that you thought I should do or whatever, but, you know, that's because I'm a man and I'll let, I'll let you down. But you can't, be, you can't be reliant or committed to any one man in your Christian life. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. It's kind of sad. It's kind of sad when you look at it from the perspective of Jesus literally saved these people. And that's, the, that's my final point. That's my final point. I mean, here Jesus, it says he can't rely on men. He knew what was in the hearts of men. He didn't have, he didn't have to have anybody tell him how men were. He didn't have to have anybody tell him how unstable men were. He didn't have to have anybody tell him how, you know, fickle men are and how, you know, if there's any trouble in their life, they're just not going to be there for him. You know, everything's great and there's a big party and you're coming into town and this is a popular thing to do right now. But as soon as it's not popular and there's some danger, we're out. Look, but Jesus wasn't committed to men. He did it anyway. He did what needed to be done. So that's my last point tonight. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Turn to Romans chapter 12. The last, it's really a question. The last point and the last thing I want you to think about this evening is what do you owe Christ? He came here to offer the sacrifice for a world that rejected him, number one. And he never wavered in that commitment. Because his commitment was to God and to no man. We'll get Romans chapter 1, or Romans chapter 12, and verse number 1. So what do we owe him for that? Look at verse number 1 of Romans 12. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at, look at that verse right there. That verse is saying that we should present this temple of our bodies. This body already houses the Holy Ghost that God has given us, that we are, we are eternally secure. There's nothing we can do if we pay nothing back. If we do nothing for Jesus Christ in our life, we're going to heaven just like somebody that does do something. That's, that's clear. But we should present our bodies a living sacrifice. What does that mean? It means your body should be used for the will of God. Holy, acceptable unto God. You should be doing things. This is what God wants from you. He wants you to do things that are acceptable unto him. He wants you to live a holy life. He wants you to do it. And you say, well, if I do that, I'm pretty good. No, that's your reasonable service. That's the least you can do, is what that is saying. He offers any eternal life to any that believe on him, including these people in John chapter 2. And still, those people do not love him. Still, those people, you know, they do not follow him. That's why you meet these people out there. They're not saved, and they're just like, we just need to follow Jesus. You're not following Jesus. Give me a break. Amen. Even if it was true that you had to follow Jesus to be saved, you're still going to hell. These people aren't following anyone but their own will. Amen. But the Bible says once we're saved, it is reasonable. It is the least we can do to serve the Lord with our lives. I mean, what do we owe him? The answer, the answer to what do we owe Jesus is everything. That's the answer. The answer, what do we have to do to get to heaven? Nothing. But what do we owe him? Everything. Our bodies. Our lives. We should, we should give our lives as a sacrifice. That, that's what is, that is acceptable to God. Will God look back? Think about this. Will God look back at your life when you're standing before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, will he look back at your life and say, that's an acceptable life for me? You're not in danger of hell at the judgment seat of Christ, but will he look back at your life and, and, and will it be an acceptable life unto God? That, that's what you owe him. And that's not like some fantastic, amazing thing. Th that's, that's, the, that's the bottom. That's just reasonable. That's why people that get saved... People that get saved and then just do nothing in their Christian life, which is the majority of Christians. People that get saved do nothing for the rest of their life. They take their salvation. They tell nobody about it. They're saved. They know they're saved. 
They know how they're saved. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And look, it, it's, a, it's a horrible character issue. Because they're just like, I'm just going to keep this to myself, and I don't care what my reasonable service is. I don't care what, you know, Jesus wants of me. I got mine. And, Je you know, he's not going to break that promise. I mean, these are saved people we're talking about tonight. These are saved people in the last two verses of John chapter 2. We're talking about people that they can't, you know, save people. They can't find the time to, to fit God in their busy life. They can't find time to pray. They can't find time to read the Bible, much less do what's in it. Before you, before you can do what's in the Bible, you know what? You've got to open it up and read it. They can't find time to make one hour in their life every day for the Lord. They can't find time to come to church. Nobody comes to church anymore. It's like this huge thing in America now. Like nobody's going to church anymore. It's just something people just don't do anymore. There's a, but, and I get it. There's a lot of false churches and a lot of these people aren't saved. There's a lot of saved people that don't go to church. But guess what, folks? It's a story of, it's a story of unreturned love is what these last two verses in John is. It's a story of, look, you're saved because God loved you. You're saved because God loved the world. That's why you're saved. You're not saved because you love God. You should love God, meaning you should do the works that he wants you to do. But you're saved because he loved you. You know, Matthew 7, it's, it's all about Jesus knowing you, not you knowing him. Like, he says, I never knew you. Like, he said, look, those people in Matthew chapter 7, they knew who Jesus was, but he didn't know them. Because they had not trusted on him. It's a story of unreturned love, just like Leah, except this is a much better example because this is like the perfect story of unreturned love. So the question is, is that you? Is that you who just doesn't return the love of Jesus? You know, you're, you're happy to be saved, but you're just not going to do anything about it. Is that us? To a degree, it's all of us. I mean, this story of Jesus is just, it's a story through and through of betrayal. Betrayal by the world, betrayal by the Jews, betrayal by the Romans, but betrayal by the people that are saved too. The people that got saved and just like Jesus literally just he couldn't commit himself to them because otherwise he wouldn't have finished his ministry because men will let you down. John 2 is a great, these, these verses are great verses because they show us Jesus' perspective. See, we look, at, we look at Jesus like, I'm so thankful that Jesus came. Jesus, the Son of God, born of a virgin. You know, he, he was God and man at the same time. He lived this perfect life. He died on the cross, bare our sins in his own body. That's our perspective. He died, was buried, went to hell for three days and three nights, rose again from the dead. And if somebody trusts on that, you're going to heaven. That's our perspective. His perspective is he came here to do that for a bunch of people that didn't even love him. Not only were we yet sinners, but we just didn't love him. That's Jesus' perspective, these two verses. Put a quotes around those verses, a bracket around those verses. That's the perspective of Jesus' ministry on earth, is that he came here to do this for a bunch of people that not only didn't deserve it, but rejected. So much so that he couldn't even commit or trust any of them. It's really a sad story. But the importance, folks, let me just end on this. The importance of seeing other perspectives is very important in your life. If you can somehow, you know, be able to successfully, this is like a bonus point here. If you can successfully put yourself in a position where you can see somebody else's perspective on things, just like we're seeing I showed you Leah's perspective. I'm showing you Jesus' perspective. But if you can successfully see somebody else's perspective, you're going to have successful relationships in your life. You think about, just, I mean, the simplest ones. Think about coworkers. You think about a, a project at work. You're working on something with five different people. And, you know, everyone's kind of got a different idea on things. But guess what? If you can see the perspective of the other people and why they wanted to do it that different way, you're going to be very successful 
in dealing with people. And if you're just like, no, that's not right, and you know, you can just do it my way, and this is how you have to look at it. No, but if you can put yourself in somebody's shoes and say, okay, I can see from your experience and your background how you could see it that way. All right, let's walk that through and see how this works out. You can be very successful at collaborating with people and, and building relationships. Friends are the same thing. If you can see, I mean, friends that have conflicts. Look, people, people that are friends for a long time are going to have conflicts. People that, you know, are, are very close friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, go to church, you know, three times a week together. You know, there's going to be conflicts. That's, it's okay. It's normal. It's how you handle those conflicts is, is whether we're successful or not. But if you can see other people's perspective, you're going to be very successful in relationships. Just as we can, you know, I'm showing you Jesus' perspective tonight, and you're like, whoa, that's bad. Yeah, it's bad. But seeing the perspective from Jesus' view helps us serve Jesus in our life. It helps us get things right in our life. It should be a motivator to us. Think about a husband and a wife. Think about a husband and a wife. Here's, the, here, here's what I think the two main um, misconceptions in hu the husband and wife relationships are. Maybe this isn't true for you, but here's, here's, here's the perspective. See, they're different perspectives. The husband has a different perspective than the wife does. And if the wife can put herself in the husband's shoes, and at least not in his shoes, but if she can see things from his perspective, she's going to be a much, she's going to be much more successful as a wife. If a husband can see his wife's perspective, he's going to be much more successful as a husband, and they're going to have a better relationship, is what will happen. Here's the most common misconceived perceptions of husband and wife. See, the, the husband, the husband, he does see things from a different perspective. Because why? Because he's looking at the whole thing. He's looking at, look, he's the leader. The husband's the leader of the family. I'm talking about a biblical husband here. He's the leader of the family. He sees the whole thing. He's going to work. He's making decisions for the family. He's, you know, running the finances. He's doing all these different things. That's a heavy burden. That's a heavy burden. That can be a very stressful, you know, situation at times in a man's life, especially a man that is, that is leading how he's supposed to lead. There's a lot of balls to keep in the air. If the, wife, if the wife can recognize that about her husband, recognize that maybe he, he's not paying enough attention to this one thing that I really think should be paid attention to or, or whatever, but if she can just look at it from the perspective like, man, he's running this whole thing. He's got all, these, he's got all this weight on his shoulders. He's got all these, this, this wheelbarrow of bricks upon him. Maybe she would be more understanding. Maybe she would be more, if she could just see things from that perspective. But the wife, it's easy for the wife to just get blinders on and, and just see her world right there and just, you know, maybe, you know, not see the other things that her husband's looking at. And look, put yourself in his perspective. It'll help you be a better wife. What about the husband? Uh, just the flip side of that is that a husband, because he's looking at the whole thing, and he's driving the whole ship, and there's all these different moving parts. The husband many times will put maybe not as much emphasis on one of the smaller parts that, is, that are really giving his wife a hard time or giving his wife some trouble. But if he can put himself in her perspective, you know, if, if my, I'll use my wife as an example, I'll just, I'll just make up an example. But if my wife is just, if she's, you know, having a problem with a very specific area, Here's what not seeing her perspective would be like. Look, I got all this stuff to deal with. Just forget about that. That's just going to cause her more stress. It's going to cause her more anxiety. It's going to cause her more you know, trouble in her life with the things that she's dealing with, the, the things that she does have responsibility for. But if I can put myself in her perspective and just say, OK, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. Let me think about. You know, maybe I need to put more focus in that one area and, and not, you know, maybe move something around or whatever. Put yourself in her perspective. Look, the more that you cover those things and put yourself in the perspective of your wife and the things that she's having trouble with, the more comfort she will feel. The less stress that she will have. But it's all about seeing things from her perspective and seeing things from his perspective. You know, if you think, I mean, it's two completely different roles. 
And if we can both, as a, me as a husband and my wife as a, as a wife, if we can see each other's perspectives, we will have a great relationship together. You know, and that's, you know, obviously that takes time to spend with each other and, and talk with each other and, and, and all those different things. But this is just, just some examples of the importance of seeing things from other perspectives in your life. And that's really like the perspective of Jesus is really the story here. The perspective of Jesus is so sad that he couldn't even trust or put faith in the people that were even saved, that he saved on this earth. And when we see that perspective, it should give us motivation to help us to drive forward in this holy life, this acceptable life that God wants us to live. That's really the story of these two verses in John chapter 2, is just motivating us through the eyes of Jesus to live that holy and acceptable life. Because it's, it's the reasonable thing we can do. You're saved. You're saved. It's, it's, the, it's the least that you can do. Different perspectives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.